I'm really excited about today and the, we're about ready to open this building and, and when I look back on the whole process I remember very very early on uh, a very uh, important moment in the process and that was that we were given this site this meadow and and the physical planning director said I, I thought what a wonderful thing the lagoon would be and the physical planner said Stephen stay away from the lagoon because there's a utility line in this road here and we cannot move that and you can't build on it. So I worked very, very hard to prove that it would be possible to put the building and engage the lagoon. And part of the, part of the charge then is also to get the whole 70,000 square feet on two levels, two and a half levels. And the library then goes off over the lagoon and engages the views and all. But one of the things that I said that Dick Gibson, who was then in charge of physical planning, I think got the idea it was a good idea. I said, now the university has this meadow as a future site. That's got to be worth something, this huge piece of land, a site like this. So this is a, you know, this is the result of a lot of work on our part, but I, I think we have really a really special building, and it started in the problem of the site plan. So you can see already here now as we, was, as we enter, all the faculty offices are along the north, the diffused light of the glass plank, we'll see that when we get inside. Every faculty has their own operable window. The spaces are quite generous in, in volume and in light. And we place the auditorium above so that we could turn the corner, if you will, with the shape of the auditorium and, and put the gallery right where everybody would see it. Anybody who comes in and goes in this building can see the art gallery. And that's very important to connect to other people in the university, invite them to see the artwork and pass by. So we'll, I'll show you the sequence now as we enter. So the, the auditorium itself forms a kind of canopy that becomes the entrance, but you get a glimpse of what's going on in the art gallery. So it's almost like connection to the street, almost like a, a storefront window, if you will, of a gallery, so that people who, let's say, wouldn't be going here to go to school, maybe they're from engineering, they're from you know, sort of business or science. They want to walk through here because they heard about the lagoon, but they also see there's something on exhibit in this gallery. Maybe that'll catch their curiosity. They'll go in, they'll look at art. Right from this moment, when you first enter the building, the idea is that you would feel that you didn't enter a building. You entered space that keeps going. So as you can see, even though we just came inside and we're only 10 feet inside, we can see the, the, the limestone bluff over there. We can see the pond over there. So this notion of openness or porosity is kind of the first experience of the building that you can, you're in it, that you can see right through it. And that's very important. So, so uh, we needed to keep things very, very open here. And then the stair is a kind of folded plate that, that takes the whole energy of the building up through the different levels. So it kind of, you know, in a way, pulls you up. And the stair doesn't come down, it's suspended. It's suspended on cables. You can see the, the sort of idea that there's something up there that you should, you know, come up through the building. And the, 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 the sort of planar structure, by the way, everything in this building is exposed. So it's like a didactic teaching tool. The structural columns are exposed, the concrete planks are exposed. Here, the, 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 the beams that hold up the stairs are actually the side of the stair, so the guardrail is really the beam, then, then it, the folded plate is welded to that, and those rods hold the whole stair from above. So the whole feeling of structure is really 30% of architecture, and uh, I, 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 we're really exposing that so people can see how it's made and understand how simple it is in its, comp in its spatial complexity. Here, when I, this is one of my favorite places in the building. Now we're only 30 feet into the building, but you can feel the energy of the, the library that had to be pushed out over the, the pond so we could get views and also accommodate all the program, but it pulls space back in so that you can feel this whole, let's, let's say, thrust of space coming back into the building and then almost like the space breaks open here. And this is where this feeling of everything connecting vertically and horizontally is kind of hacked. So this is kind of 
in a way, the center of the building. In classical architecture, that would be the rotunda. So uh, this is the, the sort of gallery, and the idea is that, that there will be openings. This is the size of a gallery in New York, a small gallery in the Chelsea, similar proportions. And uh, the idea is that this becomes a kind of closed, a, a lockable space for, for night. But the whole building, as you can see as we go through it, is full of art. And that's what I really like, is that wherever there's walls that can receive art, Dorothy's already installed a lot of pieces, and that's what the place is about. So, and it's, and it's a good. Those are all student pieces. Those are all student pieces. Yeah, Great. So, so it has, it has a gallery which is really gallery-like, lockable, secure, can have formal openings and all. But it also has a lot of spaces where ongoing student works are exhibited, and you know, so that the feeling of the place is really alive. This is very important. Uh, I remember when I went to architecture school, our architecture school didn't have a cafe. And the cafe was at the art school. And that was called Parna Parnassus, Cafe Parnassus at the art school. And I would go over to the Cafe Parnassus and get my coffee and hang out and see what was going on in the art school. And I liked it better than what was going on in the architecture school. And when I was, can I tell stories during this thing? I mean, there's no program here. I, nobody wrote the script, right? When I was a sophomore in architecture school, I liked Cafe Parnassus and I liked the art school so much that I decided to drop out of architecture because I was getting always A's in painting and sculpture. And I thought, this is what I should be doing. These stupid architects, what do they have to say? They're teaching me about stair, rise, and run, you know? I was trying to do interesting architectural projects, but the instructors were so pragmatic that I was getting very upset and my painting teacher who had I remember wire rim glasses and had a very serious look said to me I told him I was going to drop out and switch to art and he said Stephen I wouldn't do that if I were you and he gave me a C in painting that term <laughs> so I didn't drop out it was a seminal moment in my life sophomore in in the University of Washington School of Architecture and uh, I had to go back and thank him afterwards. But the, what he said, he said, I was an architecture student, and I switched. And I don't think you should. Anyway, he gave me a C, and I didn't switch. But my real you know, sort of joy was always at the art school and not at the architecture school. So to make this building, for me, is closer to my heart than to make an architecture school. My, my brother's a painter. My dad is is 86 years old and still sketches with charcoal. I have drawings he makes every time I get him going. Uh, my wife is a filmmaker and, and sculptor. She's going to be here this afternoon. So art is part of my life. In fact, it's why I'm in New York. I would be probably in some nicer city if it wasn't for the world of art there. So you can see the, the sort of uh, opening here. And here's some of the lecture halls. That's very important. And all day long as the sun moves across, you know, the sun moves across here and changes the re relation of the pond. And in the late afternoon, the sun will reflect on the underside of that bridge, dapples of light. And that's something you have to come here and see because you cannot photograph that. And all the seasonal changes are magnified in the water. When it gets to be yellow leaves in the fall, we'll see that reflected here. And then, of course, in the winter when it's frozen, so this notion of seasonal change in the building, that's key. That's really part of the whole, that's part of the idea of why we're embracing this limestone bluff and this leftover pond, is that the phenomenological season changes and the change of light and the change of temperature, the change of colors, those, all those details are inspirational and, and they can be brought back into your everyday experience right through this, this kind of connection. We like the idea of wood sort of warmth and uh, the feeling that these auditoriums are like vessels. That one's busy.
and the feeling that the building is open all over the edges so that it invites you to walk through it. So one idea, oh, when I said the sort of fuzzy edges and porosity, one idea is that this piece of, of reading room comes out and forms a kind of portal, kind of overlapping space, and invites people who are on that end of campus to walk through the building. And they can just walk through without going inside if they want. They can walk along this boardwalk. Kind of hang out here. And, and this, is, this is a great piece of sculpture that it's not going to be unveiled until later on today by Richard Archschwager called Sitting. So this whole relation of the water, the sort of feeling of a boardwalk, you know, like something near a lake, or near the seashore, or near water, where you have this feeling of wood and, and, and the kind of, let's say, tactile relation of the, of the actual water. But the feeling that you can just move through the building, you know, move around it, and, 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 and that's why we made this extra wide. People could ride their bikes through here if they needed, you know, and then just keep going onto the campus. So this is really, in, this, this piece of space is really the idea of a, an extension of campus. This isn't just a building, this is a piece of campus space. And all over the campus you have greens and walkways, but here you have a wooden boardwalk and a pond. So it's a different feeling of campus space. It, 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 you know, I think the campus is very rich. There's many bridges, you have river edges, you have wonderful things, but this is something nowhere else on campus, a boardwalk and a pond. So, you know, in some cases, people might not go inside, they just keep walking right through and go out. This is one of my favorite spaces right here. Uh, you can start to see the water, the sunlight is reflecting there on the underside. Um, I'm making a building in China right now with enormous amount of this kind of space. I really like this. You're not inside, you're outside. But are you outside or are you inside? And you're, you know, the feeling that something extends in both directions and multiplying your views. But it's very important, the treatment of the underside, because that's a reflective kind of sky. And by the way, we have two stories of library above us. So what we've done is we've multiplied the volume of the possibility in three dimensions of using this area. So in, in architecture, especially in urban places where you want to have more landscape, you want to have relations to the landscape, you want to multiply the possibilities, this is one possibility where this is quite an enormous uh, volume, so it's not oppressive. The problem with making these is you can't make them too low. This has to be plenty high to, be, to feel good. Otherwise, it's too, it's too compressed. And this is a fire stair that we were required later, later in the process to add to the project, but I really like it because when you stand in that middle stair there, it's almost as if that kind of cacophony of stairs extends out into the landscape. A lot of people go up that stair just to, to experience it. The door's locked at the top, of course, because it's an emergency exit to go out. But they like to go up there and see how it feels and then come back down again. So it's, I guess it's open. You can go up and then come down. So now we'll go up another level. This is intentional. This is a little way of turning the stair. I could have started the stair on that side, but I would rather bring you to the corner so that you could meditate a little bit on this open field and then that was very important that this has no mullion it just goes open but you're on the stair already you're on your way up it's very important the details to me are very important even though the building is made up of just raw sections of steel raw plank the development, let's say, of a very simple fluorescent low energy light fixture is merged with the section of the column. So this, this sort of simple steel clip that holds this light and leaves this reveal exposing the structure 
that kind of, and the, also the twist of the steel before it becomes the guardrail. That's not an expensive building. The building is $200 a square foot. This entire building is like $14 million. The geometry of the detail is very important. The, the, just the simplicity, like you see the, the steel, and then in the concrete, this is white Iowa limestone. So white Iowa, Iowa limestone, if you grind it with a terrazzo grinder, almost, look, to me, it looks better than terrazzo. But this is like $4 a square foot, and terrazzo is $20 a square foot. So the whole building is this natural white Iowa limestone ground with a terrazzo grinder, and then wa the, the, the floor waxer goes over the top of it, giving it a sheen. So the natural, let's say, maintenance program will keep bringing this sheen level up, give it durability. Go into the library. So now we're in the library, the main level, and the feeling of, I heard one of the students say, when I go out the library bridge, I have the feeling I'm in an airport and I'm taking off. I think that's a good analogy, because I think a library is a place where you escape, you go into another reality. You open a book, you start to really get excited about something completely different that you never read before. So this notion of browsing, being able to just pick up a book that, you've, that you don't even know what you're looking for, you find something you never saw before, that's very important in a library. And so we have open stacks. You have all the journals of old art magazines, ceramic, monthly. You know, and the possibility then also of getting away from everyone and going out to the end and being in a reading room that's very suspended and very peaceful. So if there's a lot of noise and activity going on in the school, you can come all the way to the end of this bridge, this bridge section, and there's a two-story volume over 30 feet high that is like a real reading room in a university. I remember when I went to the University of Washington, I always liked to go to the Suzolo Library because the ceiling was so high. And when I was working, I was reading, I would stop and I would look. And that's what this room is about. This is a real, this is a kind of a volume of a reading room that's really about being able to stop reading your book, gaze out, get a distant view, look up, and then go back to work. So there's these tables, work tables, um, and it's a kind of special place in the school, a cube of space. You can see from the next level up, there's even a little window type portal that you can look out. The idea that you can just sit down somewhere and look out and like look at something or think about something, that's all over the place. There are all these benches and nooks and crannies and places to, to rest and think, which is really important for education. So here we are in, a, in another reading area and study area, very uh, different than the one we were just in. And here's where all the compressible stacks are. An enormous number of volumes can be put into this library because of the compressible stack system, which most libraries have nowadays, but this is a special one that's very easy to use. And then you, you can see that you can put 10 times as many volumes in a system like this in this kind of an area. I always like these spaces that are kind of more secluded, more back in the corner. Here you can, you can get a view of the whole greenery and the pond, but you're more private back here. So we thought that we would even extend that to an even more private area. This is really another extension into the 
bluff into the limestone bluff. And I, 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 th I think that places like this are very important, but I, you know, I would just like you to sort of see this. I'm really happy to see the school is inhabited, but when people inhabit space, they make it their own. And you can see here, uh, she has her shoes, her pictures of her mom and dad, the Coke can, all the books she's working on. That's like, that's like a very important thing for a student to have these kind of private spaces that are helping them study, that are helping them work. And that's, that's, that's what a place like this is about with a private study carols in this area. So the volume changes, the light changes, different time of day. You could also, in a building like this, you could study all day because you can move from one part of it to another, depending on how the light is. You could go from the morning, you could go from one area. In the afternoon, you could be studying in another area. So all the faculty have private offices. Now, that's very important because they have meetings with students, and, and that's a very, let's say, one of the kadoos of being on a, a faculty in a, in a great school. And uh, these offices are very special. Can we go inside one? Yeah, John. It's the third one. So the idea is that, this is very full, but you can see the idea is that there's a kind of space that goes up, and these are north-facing walls. So in order to cut the glare, we made this in structural glass plank. And you can see how it just picks up the green tint of the lawn, and it cuts down the glare. And here, every, every office has an operable window. You can see the window is open here. The screen is working. And this office, of course, is very computer equipped, um, very, <laughs> very used. <I'm sighs> so the auditorium is, is especially designed for digital projection. And now you know with the capacity we can join several digital images horizontally. And that's why the screen, instead of the traditional screen being just a little rectangle there, goes across the whole wall. And then all the projectors of different types can be coming out of here. And we used special felt. We wanted the floor to be hard. That's easy to clean. It's also economical. We have uh, some cloth on the, on the seats, but wooden backs. But the acoustic, this is a very good acoustic room. And the way we do that is to be sure that the back wall is absorbent. So we get a little bit of acoustic boost in these wooden light troughs that, and also the shape helps a lot but I'm, I'm very excited that this works so well acoustically. This is a feeling of the space sliding through. You know, these little moments are very important because you, you, you know where you are in the building. That's where that turn of the auditorium brought us in the entrance. That showed us how to get into the building. You see the curve right here in space, but instead of just allowing this to kind of join the rectangle with all the offices, this slot is very important because you, can, you get orientation. Okay, it's also for natural light. But when you're in the building, you know where you are. You immediately get orientation. And I try to always put enough of these whenever you're walking around a building this size that you can remember where you are, you understand where you are. There's the north, there's that lawn. But that's, that's a very important little slot of, of space. This is a media black box experimental space for the fusion of dance, video projection, film, poetry, kind of, yeah, the fuzzy edges There's where, fuzzy edges space. yeah, where art and film merge, where performance art and dance merge, where you, you could try to do anything. So this needed to be big and flexible and dark with big screens and the possibility of projecting on walls. There's another screen there, right, Martin? That's right. This is a huge screen here. There's another screen over there. So this is a kind of instrument for blurring the edges of art.
There's another vantage point going out. That feeling of the space going out and coming back in. The, the balcony here, these are part of the ideas that the building engages the landscape on all sides so that you can see it's set up for a little reception, David. That's, that's an extra, let's say, extension of space. So this room is really a sculpture and art and design. Of course, all the rooms have a certain flexibility. They can be reprogrammed later on in years. But we were looking at the space and I decided that this could be the ac actual geometry of the, the studio of Brancusi in Paris. So the interesting thing about this room is this north light, this is due north, and that's why this box is twisted slightly on top of the auditorium volume. But this sky reflection plane is the exact same angle as Brancusi's studio and that's the exact same height and the same width. So for any student wanting to look at uh, the history of sculpture studios, and I think his was a kind of seminal one in Paris, this is exactly the same geometry. So that's, that's sort of a didactic tool. We, we would like to make slices in space to allow you to remember where you are or experience new relation between things. So you can see here where literally we made a slice through this wall connecting to the rods that are suspending the stair and you can see the bridge in the distance. So that that kind of a little moment is very important in the experience of the architecture. Another North Light studio for painting, and I love the smell of fresh oil paint. And you really feel like you're in an art school when you can smell that linseed oil. That's, those are drying canvases over there, and uh, the, the sort of ambiance of, of, of easels uh, and the kind of the clutter of a painting studio. This is a different one over here. Looks like they're doing Morandi still lives. the work tables, that's all part of it. You can see the still lives are set up. She's working, she's working away. So the, the, we carry that kind of rough concrete floor right through. Again, we can come back outside. And now you're, you know, let's say that you want a break from your painting. You've been painting for two hours straight, standing up. <sighs> you need some fresh air. And this is just a little strip balcony that comes out. You get fresh air, but you remember where you are. You can see there's the library over there. Here's the pond. So there's many places, and they're all different. There's a different vantage point of Richard Archwager's art piece from above. So you can see the, the hefty steel on the cantilevers that we had to uh, include in the structure to be able to span out, go out over this great pond. And uh, we leave everything exposed. So anyone who wants to investigate the structural properties, that's all part of the experience. And you always get these 
views back to the lagoon and back to the original building, back to the other edge of the building. This is a graphic design studio. Excuse us for one minute. A darker room needs to be dark because of most of its digital work, but just a little peekaboo window down to that library where we were earlier, you can see. That sort of the feeling of the space connecting without disturbing it. So now you're in a minute you're gonna drop down below the underside of the bridge. So this is a kind of special moment in the right here. So even if you know, even if the fire department sometimes gives you a pain, it can be kind of exciting having to do the things that they ask you to do. So this, I rather like this. I mean, you wouldn't ever get this point of view unless we had to do this emergency stair. So that's a piece, that's the Arschwager piece. And, uh, you know, he cited it to be really, you know, part of the building and uh, I really like the way it sits there. It's feet almost touching the water. I think that's about the tour. Uh, I don't want to show you the basement because that's not very interesting. Uh, I would just say that I'm really excited about today and it's really been an exciting seven years since we made our first sketches when we first started this project. And like I said before, it's an architect's only doing half of it. And in our case, you know, Rod Cruzy and his team and Martin Cox and me doing some watercolors, but then Dorothy Johnson and and Rod and, and Dick Gibson in the beginning. It's all been a big collaboration. So it's really an extraordinary building and by no means a building that I did alone. It's really an extraordinary collaboration. And I'm very excited. I think it's probably the best thing that we've ever done. And I say that because it's so economical. I don't think we did a building for $200 a square foot before. So that's another reason and it's also why do I like it? I like it way more than private residences or something like that because this is a building that's a gift to the campus that everybody gets to use forever. And, and uh, also commercial work is not that interesting. Museums are interesting, but nowadays everybody wants to do a museum after the Bilbao effect. And that's not interesting after all either. That gets quite boring. So this school, which has got all these different functions, library, auditorium, you saw the black box room, this is one of my favorite buildings just because it's, like we said, an instrument, a hybrid instrument that does different things. And we're really glad they're starting to, to use it to play the music. Thank you.